Hello and welcome to the Compendium of Discomfort. My name is Michael and we're back to talk about Yugo Sakamoto. If you don't know who that is, I made several videos about his movies and his filmography. And now we're making a little jump in his filmography. I thought I would be faster making these videos. I'm not. I'm quite lazy. Or I did other videos. Anyway, um, it will take a little bit more time. But since this week it's time for Baby Assassin's Nice Days, I thought I should finally rewatch the first two and make videos about those. So that's uh, what's happening now. I watched uh, this one. Baby Valkyrie. Huh? Valkyrie. Valkyrie. And um, yeah, I think I mentioned it at some point before that um, I saw the poster quite a lot at my local cinema just around the corner here and thought it looks interesting looks fun but um i didn't go and then when i decided hey maybe i should give it a try it was gone from cinema after a really really long time and therefore i watched this one pretty late basically just before part two came out so it has been been already released in the US I think and um, yeah so I was a little bit late to that party but um, yeah I was pretty late with um, getting the movie not like physically that's another problem I'm very annoyed that I didn't buy the blu-ray earlier because I would have been able to get the special edition with bonus disc and all but after I watched the movie for the first time, I thought, yeah, it's good, but there's some stuff that I don't like so much and some stuff, nah, it was my top priority and I thought, oh, let's wait until it's getting a little bit cheaper, but then the Blu-ray was basically sold out and now it costs like 30 to 40,000 yen and uh, it's really annoying, so yeah, for the release of the third one, they made a new double set pack thingy where you can get the regular disc again so that's not so bad at least i can enjoy the audio commentary which i obviously haven't listened to now but uh, if i listen to it and i find something interesting i will make another video here like i always say um, reviews are always work in progress for example i listened to the german episode that we recorded in january when i watched the movie for the second time i think and I felt like I was really negative about it. I mean, I still liked it, but there were some things that I didn't really get. Why is it like this? Why doesn't it work like uh, maybe other movies or something? And I think, no, I got it. Yay. So, uh, yeah, just to to uh, get this out of the way, yeah, I... I leveled it up step by step from uh, four to five so it's a very very good movie i was very well entertained i watched it yesterday i watched it today again so now i'm at four times and yeah it, it makes sense if you uh, rewatch it there's some, some stuff that's really a bit weird unconventional maybe and um yeah i, I felt like this time i understood it much better and i could enjoy it much better so yeah if you don't get it first time maybe just give it another try or watch some other of his movies um get a bigger understanding of what he does what he uh, likes as that's why i wanted to talk about the whole filmography and i will still finish it i will still talk about the others but just in a slightly different order so yeah that's basically my story with this movie and um yeah i remember when i watched the second one in the cinema i liked it much more now i'm very curious to see how i feel about the second one 
next time because there was some again i watched the second time for for a german uh podcast that we did and there were some things that annoyed me very very much especially at the beginning and at the end and um let's see how that works out for me this time and uh a special occasion usually usually i don't do that that often but uh, we have notes plenty of notes and several pages of notes uh, good maybe um i can uh, throw in some more deeper thoughts than i usually do after i go to the cinema i mean i, I don't take notes in the cinema and then i go home and i have to process and then there were no subtitles and I need to process more and I was sometimes pretty busy just understanding the movie. So this time is a little bit more relaxed uh, because I could watch it several times. I had subtitles, which were sometimes not so good, I felt. But that's another story. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, let's talk about Baby Assassins from 2021 with uh, Yugo Sakamoto. Um, yeah, we, we have mentioned the two main actresses in several at several different occasions, so I won't talk much about them. It's uh, these two. Um, this is uh, Akari Takaishi and Saori Izawa. And there's one very funny thing. Um, some people suspected that I mentioned that in a different video too. Some people suspected that these are the same characters as in Sakamoto's movie A Janitor, even though they have completely different names and uh, so on. Like in A Janitor they're called uh, Shiho and Rika. And um, here in this interview, very interesting, um, Akari Takaishi says that she didn't want to play the same character again and she hoped the director wouldn't ask her to do it exactly the same like she wanted it to be two distinct people so from there on it already um yeah just a crazy idea and um, the director himself said that he might have considered it for a moment but basically he uh, stop thinking about that he, he stopped this idea because he wanted this movie to end and people know that these two girls will just keep on living like that so um yeah he never intended these two to uh, die at least not at this point i mean the, the um the promotion campaign for nice day suggested that it is all over but uh yeah probably not i guess um yeah anyway so um these two are here and they're different characters and that was just a crazy fan idea and some people believed it and it's not true it, nobody ever planned that and let's look a little bit on the rest of the cast we have some more or less uh known people here we have masanori mimoto who is a pretty great he was if i'm not wrong he was a frog guy in yakuza apocalypse and he was in uh, bad city a reborn hydra so he's a regular um regular in uh, kensuke sonomura's movies and he will be in his new movie ghost killer as well so uh, good guy very good for action stuff and yeah then we have yasukaze motomiya who uh, yeah, did a lot of yakuza films and he's playing a yakuza here as well uh, he was in graveyard of honor uh, outrage koda iso uh, shield of straw and uh, bad city as well and he was in the very fun um jigen daisuke movie that was on amazon i think Oh, and, and he was in the absolutely gorgeous, wonderful Takashi Miike film Sliver that I highly recommend, even though it's total wacky trash. It's a lot of fun. Watch it. And with 
Takashi Nishina in a very, very small role, but he is a little bit famous for being in Brother or, uh, for example, in Godzilla, Mothra, King Ghidorah, Giant Monsters, All Out Attack, or Ring 2, or uh, Gamera 3, Revenge of Iris, and some, some more movies. It, it's uh, like more like a cameo, but um, it's a face you have seen before. And some... I, I still haven't figured out who she's actually playing here, uh, Nagi Kotsuji. Of course, um, most important for being a co-director with Sakamoto for Pun and this mysterious was Crazy Island movie. I have no idea. Um, yeah, then we have Atomo Mizuishi, who is in all the sequels. Uh, he's the um, Dead People Disposal dude. And yeah, he was in some other stuff like the Full Metal Alchemist um, live action movies or Tokyo Vampire Hotel. But yeah, it's, he's just a baby assassin's guy, regular. Um, what do we have? We have a, in a very, in a, another small role, we have Masayuki Ino. Another proof that this, uh, Sakamoto's movies are all one big, uh, and almost said serial killer, no, professional killer universe. Uh, idea is um, not true. Uh, Masayuki Ino is uh, most famous for being the legendary hitman Kunioka and he has a very very small cameo as a guy who fights with his hands. He doesn't need a gun. He can kill and then he just uh, disappears very unglamorously. Yeah, and then we have of course uh, Tsubasa Tobinaga. I think I forgot him in my video about um, Every day, of course, he's basically the boss of the two, but he hasn't done much else. And yeah, I, I guess that's it. That's the main cast that we need to talk about. And um, yeah, very fun. And uh, yeah, maybe we'll get to the story a little bit before we go into the more detailed stuff. Um, the story is very simple. We have two very young professional killers who just graduated high school and basically they are forced by their agency to live together and um, figure out how to live a normal life with uh, getting a part-time job. So more like a cover. So they seem a little bit more normal and adapt a little bit more to society. And um, yeah, they get in some trouble with some Yakuza and there's a lot of, uh, not, not that much, but at the end there's a lot of killing and bloodshed and uh, it's very entertaining. So that's a very basic story. So what are the main points here? Why this is good or bad or why you might not want to watch it? I don't know. And I know some people who don't like this at all and I totally get it like it's a bit special interest um so the main point is that it's an action comedy with the focus on comedy in the sequel there's a little bit more action and i appreciate that a lot but here in this one basically you have two action scenes like one at the beginning one at the end and in the middle there are some few small things. It's a lot like the second uh, The Fable movie, which is excellent as well. But um, yeah, I, I, it's, it's, well, when I watched these movies, I had this idea that a lot of um, Japanese action movies basically just have two action scenes and then in, in between maybe someone gets shot or hit, punched or something. But uh, yeah. Seem, there seems to be a pattern, needs confirmation, but um, yeah, it's an idea I had. Um, at least that's a very cheap way to produce movies and probably that's the reason why they did it like that. Anyway, in between you have, so for the most part, this daily life of these two girls and they're a little bit um, special. Uh, with Mahiro, played by Saori Isawa, who says she's a sociopath and can't fit into society at all. And we have uh, Chisato, played by Akari Takaishi, who um, is uh, crazy as well, but um, more 
little bit gaga, but she functions in presence of normal people quite normal as well. And um, yeah, it can be, I mean, for, for me, for me at least, uh, Mahiro is still relatively relatable. Like she just wants to be left alone, lay down on the couch, watch cat videos, and every now and then she wants to kill someone. And um, not that I kill people, but um, yeah, it's, it's something I can relate to, not having to um, go out and have conversations with, with people, uh, which is how I usually make my money. But um, I, I know the feeling. I have at least uh, days like that. So it's, it's something relatable. And she's not too annoying. She's just slacker lazy, just leave me alone, let me do my stuff. And on the other hand, Chisato is in this movie completely gaga and weird. She has some very strange mannerisms. Um, like she switches around her personality a lot. So, and that's the main point uh, Takaishi um, paid attention to when creating this character. Basically, when she's a killer, she's very serious and her posture is in a way that it's more intimidating and um, very, like, strong. But besides that, she's always <laughs> and always screaming and shouting, making weird noises. There's one scene where she's um, preparing some food or something and she always walks back and forth between the couch and the kitchen and she makes it's like, tch, 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 and uh, it's supposed to be um, dog paws on the floor, like, tch, 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 no? and um, I, I just feel like if someone like that would live with me, I would probably kill that person. I, I would go crazy. Like she's sometimes so annoying, especially as easy screaming. So I, I completely get it if you watch this movie and you feel like these are just insane people and I don't want to watch this at all. So I think for me, when, when I watched it for the first time, um, I felt like I needed some time to get in the groove, to get the feeling and um, to appreciate this weirdness. And now it's, it's working totally fine. I, I think for me, it was very good that I've been watching the TV show now because on the TV show she's way more normal and um, much nicer. So one thing that's happening in the show is basically she's the connecting piece between Mahiro and, um, and society. Like every time she confronts someone who doesn't get her personality. She's basically the translator. She explains what's going on. That's a thing she does here already, but in a very rude way, like she's looking down on Mahiro, hitting her and stuff like that. And that can be very annoying and uh, yeah, but it's a bit of the story like these two characters. They know each other and the director said that in in the interview in the pamphlet that um, this movie is um, not so much a thing of like big decisions. It's not about these characters meeting. It's no origin story like that. And there's just no like we need to save the world. There's no, no big goal. There's just this conflict that happens ac accidentally. And um, it's basically this whole confrontation, girls and uh, society, and uh, society here mostly presented by Yakuza. And um, yeah, that's another interesting point. Like, um, I think, who, who was it? Takaishi maybe said, or Isawa, I forgot. One of them said in the interview in the same pamphlet, that this movie is not about strong women dominating and destroying men. This is a normal woman being forced to fight um, for whatever. Like, they, they don't want it, but because of society, male-dominated society, they have to 
Yeah, it's it's not like they walk around and they're so super strong and they can just kill everyone. Like they they, they have to fight pretty hard and they don't really want to. That's not what they enjoy so much, and uh, that's an interesting point here. But um, yeah, the, the main point of this movie, like the director said, this is basically the Mahiro Monogatari. So Monogatari means like the tale of Mahiro, like all big Japanese tales like Heike Monogatari or Genji Monogatari, all these like classic literature things have the Monogatari in there. And this is the Mahiro Monogatari because it's focused on her development. Like Chisato is pretty much the same throughout the movie, like this whole um part-time job thing like she 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 gets a job she gets fired for some reason and i will explain later and then she finds the next job and that's fine but um mahido really really struggles to find any work and like adjust herself to this and like there's a tiny development and that's what the director said is very unusual for a movie that there's just a really, really tiny development and it's not about a big change but yeah more about um, appreciating your lifestyle and not comparing yourself to others so much. That's a pretty interesting point that for me explains some things about this movie that I uh, might have gotten wrong or at least now I can enjoy it more the way if, if I think it that way I can appreciate these decisions that he made it makes all more sense to me and that's a very very good thing so yeah it's basically so a story about a girl who tries to live her life without getting into too much discomfort or trouble and that's the main point here. It's uh, very funny if you can appreciate the sense of humor, which most likely not everybody will be able to, but uh, give it a try. Um, of course, the action is phenomenal. Like um, Kensuke Sonomura is always phenomenal, and I'm looking very, very much forward to watching uh, Nice Days and seeing more of that and his new f movie. Um, Ghost Killer will be great as well, I guess. Like before he made two other movies, Hydra and um, Bad City, and both were excellent. And I highly recommend these two as well. I think they're both out on Blu-ray in the US, so no reason to not watch them. So, um, let's stick maybe with this pamphlet thingy a little bit um, more and discuss some more things that maybe here... Uh, give some hints about the content of the movie before we go into really deep spoiler territory so yeah um interesting like the main idea for this movie was this uh, like he said it's kind of professional killer gap like when killing they're super professional and can do everything but in real life they can't um even pay their bills and don't know how the world works before because that's so so in a different world that they don't understand stuff like that so that's the basic idea of this movie and um, very interesting for this is a segment in a in a maid cafe and here he took inspiration from YouTube where he saw a clip where uh, Akira Maeda is his name I think uh, is an ex-professional wrestler and a huge guy like 192 or 93 centimeters tall and a big dude and he went with another guy into a maid cafe dressed as otaku and trying this and there is a little bit um, seemingly there was a little bit of uh, Sakamoto's um, little strange sense of humor or a little nihilistic uh, idea so he, he felt like it would be super funny if this huge ex-wrestler would just get angry at the mates and freak out and uh, there was an inspiration for this movie 
Yeah, and um, he was asked in the interview why this movie is not in chronological order. And he said, basically, um, starting with a like normal, seemingly normal girl at a job interview and then just having her escalate, kill everyone in the shop and having a big fight scene at the beginning made a lot of sense to him and uh, seemed like it would have an, b a big impact and he felt like he never saw anything like that in a movie before like someone in the middle of a job interview just uh, going straight into a big action scene so um that's one the obvious reason why he chose to uh, make it like the start of the story we have later as flashback segment um and i always felt like why except for this um reason that um uh, you have the action first but uh, let's get to that later why that is actually not that bad i just feel like it's a little bit confusing because it's a really really long flashback like 25 minutes or so and um I think the first time I watched it, I was a little bit like, oh, 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 there was all the flashback. I already forgot that we're in a flashback. Um, yeah, a uh, good thing is he didn't consider any scenes inside uh, in the high school because he felt like all, all other movies have so many high school scenes that you don't really need it here and it wouldn't do anything good to the story. It would just be like, yeah, high school, who cares? No, I, I guess it's a good decision to make them basically just graduate high school shortly after graduation and let them do their thing and try to arrive in society. I, I guess that's still something that even younger audiences can um, identify with because they all have the fear of going there. Like even if you're in high school, you can go say, oh my God, in a year or two, I'll be there as well. And I guess that works totally fine. Yeah, and um, so let's get to uh, Saudi Izawa's interview. And she, she explained her character in a very interesting way. She said a Mahito's brain is a 30% a set of work in Chisato, 20% eating, and everything else is not being used or she's unable to use it. And uh, yeah, so that's why she is the person she is and um when they started planning this movie she was already involved in the project and um the idea was that the director sakamoto would be the action director as well and she would be the action coordinator and um they sense a lot of stuff like manga movies and stuff um to show each other what they imagine it should be and what they would like to do and they felt like it would be a lot of fun to do just everything they enjoy but then she was like no maybe it's better to focus on the performance especially since it's not she's not an um, actress and this is the first time she actually has lines and dialogue and she has to act so um good decision to focus more on the performance and then she was like, yeah, let's, let's give Sonomura the job of the action director. And uh, what, what she said is special about uh, Sonomura is, like she, she gave an example that he taught her for two hours how to do jabs. And <laughs> like in her words, um, it's like you have to understand the structure of bones and muscles and how to use that to create power and um, you need to understand that without thinking to actually do Sonomura's um, insane action scenes and that's why she believes he's an amazing person like two hours just jabs and uh, that's pretty funny and yeah she, she was like she um, can identify with the character in general like she wouldn't be able to fit into normal companies and stuff as well that's why she ended up doing stunt work and here in this movie is a big apology scene 
with cake and stuff and she said she had a similar experience before um, when she wanted to apologize to someone and she, she just went there to eat, uh, buy some cake and really struggled to just buy cake and yeah well, it's pretty yeah like she, she went into the shop and the staff were like yeah what, what do you want and she walked out oh my god this is really okay so yeah she felt like that's basically her life and um, when they started shooting uh, they started actually with the company scenes and she couldn't really remember her lines and they improvised a little bit and she felt like it's a lot of like doing um doing a comedy routine so good and then we have here akari takaishi um she said she had before they started shooting this movie she already had a good relationship with uh, saudi izawa so there wasn't really a problem that izawa is not an actress because they had such good chemistry and were already feeling so well together that it was just a a thing that happened and she had more uh, issues with uh, doing the actions like she had to focus on that and uh, other thing when she watched the movie and she saw that final battle she had to cry because um yeah it's just so much seeing her friend fighting for things um yeah emotionally I got her and she said that never happens with action scenes so good good very nice and she too can identify with her character um yeah I wonder if she's like that as well in her private life yeah uh, <laughs> interesting um oh yeah and here's one thing when we have this made coffee scene and she realizes like she can't really go on here and because there's some situation that makes it impossible to work there or continue working um sakamoto gave her a movie as inspiration how to act that and that was a john rambo um okay cool yeah good and i think before we go really really deep I have some some references that popped up and I saw noticed whatever I, I think most of them are pretty obvious because they're basically in the dialogue we have a higudashi where there's a really nasty nail pulling scene and they have a machine for that and they have the same machine here that they seemingly got on Amazon and it's really scary and in the anime there's a Shion and Mion and they got get them confused because seeming they're twins I never watched Higurashi but that's one thing here we have a Shinchan at the beginning the um, the a boss of the um, company he quotes Nuhara Hiroshi and I always thought that must be some smart ass guy who says something really interesting but no it's just a Shinchan's father and I never really knew that uh yeah then we have some jojo reference and we have a um, little bit more subtle a demon slayer um there's a scene like there's a montage where they keep eating and doing stuff at home and there's one scene where uh, chisato sits on the floor with some uh, chikua in her mouth like chikua is this pipe shaped a uh, fish paste thing and she keeps it in her mouth and then I realized that she actually played Nezuko in a Demon Slayer um, when it was a, a stage play and obviously the character has a bite thing in her mouth and then in the maid cafe the boss uses a phrase that's a uh, Kusiga Sugoin Sugoinja, Kusiga Sugoinja, and it's um, translated as the, they are too picky, the customers. And um, 
Yeah, he is uh, being told that this phrase is outdated, and I didn't know that, I never heard that. And it's a phrase made popular by the comedy duo Chidori, and um, the first oldest video I found on YouTube that had this uh, phrase coming up is from 2018, so seemingly they wanted to make sure you understand the age gap between um, the owner and his staff. Yeah, so I guess from now we go through the movie a little bit and uh, I check my comments and what I think about it. Um, first, like, like I said, we have this whole combini scene with this terrible boss who quotes Shin-chan's father and makes fun about uh, Mahiro for playing video games, but at the same time, uh, yeah, quotes Shin-chan's father like a little nerd. And... Um, Suddenly she freaks out and kills him and uh, outside there are a lot of staff members who she kills as well and it's a very very big uh, fancy action scene and it was the same situation as when I watched The Fable 2. I saw it and I, saw, I felt like oh my god if we get this all the time in this movie that's the best movie ever and of course we don't but uh, it's okay. What um, sticks out here is that it suddenly turns out to be a dream and she just gets back to the reality in the interview and gets kicked out. Very cute, like the guy tells her that she's not getting the job and she tries to get a little closer and the chair is uh, squeaking. Yeah, it's, it's cute. And... Yeah, like I said, I always wondered why is this a dream sequence um, didn't make any sense to me. Because usually we would have dream sequences where people dream of something that's not possible for them to do. I mean, she would totally be able to just kill everyone in the shop. So that's very... Uh, a little bit odd choice and I was struck like well, why does it have to be a dream if you want to show how strong she is then just let her do a job like most movies would do and what's the thing that makes it necessary to yeah to, to make it a dream and um, the thing is that she can't do is just um, refuse reality and society and just kill people that's uh, her dream that she not not that she's able to but uh, not not in a physical sense but in a moral sense in a society sense and that makes a lot of fun if you consider uh, it makes a lot of sense that if you consider that this whole story is just that she tries to and find her place in this world and this is her place in this world is not working at a combini or any other place and in, in this movie like all workplaces seem horrible and um, just to accept that she's a slacker who stays home and watches cat videos and every now and then she earns some money by killing people and just accepting this like here she tries to embrace this um, lifestyle in her fantasy and at the same time there's a scene that ma makes it fit nicely with the end where she wants Chisato to help her up you know, when she's on the ground uh, she she's like this uh, help me help me and uh, Chisato helps her up and uh, that suggests that she might dream of a little bit better relationship but I mean, I mean uh, their relationship isn't that bad so I'm not sure how important this point actually is, but yeah, just this necessity to escape uh, society's standards and just live your life the way you want. Uh, the director, by the way, said too that he um, understands this issue very well because when he's not shooting movies, and shooting movies is already a little bit strange lifestyle, um, he's just living like a need. So a need is a need means not in uh, education, employment or training. So someone who is basically unemployed and just stays at home and plays video games or something like that. So uh, yeah, in between he lives like that. So basically like Mahiro 
and um, yeah so that's one reason why it's good that we have this at the beginning of course we have the impact of the action scene makes sense we have this issue of not wanting to work not not that she's not able to work but she doesn't want it she hates it yeah, everything in her heart and soul hates working and um, so that gets pretty well established here and um, yeah then we stay in this timeline a little bit for example we have the problem that after this job interview she gets a phone call from Chisato uh, who is doing a job and basically asks her to come and help so she goes there to help and then Chisato runs away so this sets the next issue between these two because Chisato leaves her to go to her part-time job and Mahiro is, doesn't understand why is a part-time job important why can't you just do your full-time job which is killing people why can't you do that seriously and why do you have to call her and leave her alone when she has to deal with this uh, dude who's basically already dead but um anyway so this sets the main conflict here like what are your priorities is your priority this like the main job or is your priority the part-time job um and we, we uh, around uh, not around throughout the movie we realize that um Chisato enjoys her part-time jobs most of the time and that's why she yeah prefers to go there every once in a while and not do the killing stuff so yeah it's a big clash of characters that gets established well here and having it structured like this actually helps quite well to not tell us why the situation that we just saw is actually much worse than we believe it's not just a conflict between these two girls but there's much more to it that we will find out later so it makes a lot of sense that it's here like that and then yeah we, we see a little bit of a chisato at work where she basically gets bullied by her older co-worker and um, the customers don't really appreciate it uh, like her work that she tried so hard to make and then she uh, knocks out one of the customers and chokes out or like twists her neck like her co-worker and gets kicked out and here we have established another thing that Chisato likes working basically like she hates how her co-worker treats her or I guess because she's really rude and um, annoying like there's one scene where she's always like um, me no mai no soko like she wants mango and she says me no mai no soko like there in front of you but where's in front of you she could say down there in this uh, fridge or something then it would be clear but now it's a soko like there and um, yeah that's a very frustrating thing that probably everybody has experienced someone giving directions or some orders and not being clear so you don't understand what they mean and i mean she's such a Acts as crazy as she's as she is, but um, yeah. So I I totally get why she hates this coworker, and um, but she seemingly likes to work, so that's a good thing. But she can't keep a job because in some way, this professional killer thing, in this case more in the way of instinct, um, comes to haunt her and gets her kicked out, and that will be another problem later. So we have a pretty big contrast be between the girls like one wants to work but can't and the other one hates it but has to and um, yeah that's a fun thing and yeah basically after this we have suddenly the big oh now we go back in time that's uh, yeah about 25 26 minutes long and 
yeah, that, that's one thing that I don't appreciate so much. I think that this flashback is too long because in between you forget that you're in a flashback and it's a little bit weird and makes it feel unnecessarily complicated. I mean, it works in the end and I think the plus points are much more. But yeah, for first time I, I don't blame anyone who's confused by this. Like you have this dream sequence, reality, flashback, back to... Uh, it's a bit, um, yeah, overly complicated, this, this whole start. And in the whole flashback, we see the build up to where we were, which is something that you already forgot because there was this non job with this one guy who was already tied up to a chair and then got shot. And nobody would suspect that this is basically already peak confrontation here. It's kind of smart, but yeah, makes it less. Like, like for, for example, let's say. Um, Mission Impossible 3, the cold opening with uh, Tom Cruise in the airplane and it's super dramatic and you know this is such an intense scene, you know, you will get back to that. But here you don't really know to what you will get back because the scene with the guy tied to the chair is already a few minutes ago and you had some normal like other stuff like work stuff, daily life stuff. So. You don't really have this mental connection to this one scene and you don't really get the idea that oh now we're doing the build up for that scene because you don't know anything special about that scene. As a, ah, a bit um, maybe clumsy. So it works fine if you watched it before, you watch it twice, three times and suddenly you're like oh yeah, yeah that all makes sense, it works pretty fine. But um, yeah first time is a little bit like oh. oh what's going on here yeah and uh, there's a very cute um, flyer they get that basically says working people are amazing when they talk to their boss who explains to them the situation like they have to live together and find jobs and work together and work and stuff and um, yeah then we would get one of the um, jokes that makes me the most annoyed in part two, like this typical, oh, I thought you listened, I didn't listen. Yeah, uh, nah. uh, I mean, here, here it's a tiny, tiny thing, and the second one it's way more annoying because it's way more relevant for the story. But, uh, yeah, anyway, we, we get uh, Yakuza family introduced, and it's pretty funny how they basically. Um, mirror the characters we have. I mean, there's a family of three people, girls are only two, but um, there's a father and the daughter, a little bit similar to Mahiro and Chisato. Like, the father is this crazy old Yakuza who is um, like, we need to change society, and um, he wants to make everything more female oriented, you need to appreciate Papa Katsu as a business model like Papa Katsu is um, basically uh, uh, young girls dating old men to get some money and uh, yeah like that and more yeah female oriented work which his daughter does uh, and he's uh, not very good with jokes, he doesn't really understand other people, doesn't really understand how to uh, interact with normal people and um, yeah, uh, feels a bit like Mahiro. He knows a lot about uh, killing and violence and uh, that's all. And his daughter is this completely crazy, I, I think she's usually drunk here, uh, at least it's mentioned that she smells like alcohol and she's just crazy screaming running around very intense um and she has this, this dolce and gabbana connection with uh, chisato and yeah basically these are the main antagonists there's an like i said a son who's um like in between he's uh, more this traditional let's do yakuza hardcore stuff um yeah, his father doesn't really appreciate that and his 
sister always makes fun of him because she feels like she's the superior human in this family and uh, there's a lot of fighting here but um yeah basically the brother always um loses and uh, yeah he's more there to uh, interact with them because they don't interact with each other that much but he's always there with his father and then meets his sister and there's some argument going on so we get introduced to them and they find out that one of their boys got killed and basically the daughter gets the mission to find the killer and surprise she, surprise she realizes because of Dolce and Gabbana and um like she smells uh, like tissue and all oh, Dolce and Gabbana so she knows she must look for someone who uses perfume like that and yeah, she does some research and finds eventually someone who um gave the uh, order to kill this guy and then she gets a connection and then we get back to this one dude and uh, that before Mahiro entered the scene um, Chisato already walked into a trap and uh, her gun got stolen and she was lucky that she's not dead and stuff like that so suddenly this all makes sense but like i said the, the first scene of this job with the guy um tied to the chair is has such little impact that you don't expect it to be a main plot point and the whole plot is so loose um it's more like coincidence it's more like stuff happens and that's a thing that um, Sakamoto did a lot in his older movies there's not much focus on plot uh, something like Hangman's Knot or Slaughter Jab we will get to these movies eventually um, don't have much consistent plot going on it's more like scenes and here's a little bit more consistent writing a little bit more focus on this plot but there's still a lot in between with just stuff happening and um yeah it's uh some, someone said it's a good hangout movie like you meet your friends and uh, just hang out with them and i would agree with this but because of the structure i feel like you, you must pay attention <laughs> to know what's going on if you haven't watched it yet or yeah you just watch it three thousand times and then you will eventually get it and it's yeah yeah, I mostly agree, but it's a little bit challenging for a hangout movie, I feel. Oh, third time, fourth time, you can just sit there and relax. First time, pay attention. Anyway, so it all makes sense. And in the end, um, we get this new job. The one, one big thing in the second half of the movie, after we came back from the flashback, like... Chisato has a new job and Mahido wants to join her. They get into this um, into this maid cafe. And um, yeah, first we have basically two, two blocks in the maid cafe. One is the day where Mahido tries to work there and completely fails while Chisato is completely invested and gets along with the people. And there's another big gap between them which makes uh, Mahito feel extremely bad and go home and um, be depressed a little bit and w w it's basically the moment where she decides that she can't really um, fit into society like she can't do this stuff and um, yeah, but Chisato, on the other hand, gets along with the other people very well. There's a lot of communication. There's a lot of um, <coughs> a lot of talk about prices and how poor people can't even afford a sandwich from the kombini. Um, that's uh, pretty sad. Uh, there are some references to the bad economy economy of uh, Japan, and uh, yeah, so. Here, like in this situation, in this uh, workplace, 
the sad thing is that Shisato doesn't even try to get Mahiro involved. Like probably some people have experienced something like that. They do something with their friends and their friends get along well with everyone while well, you're a little bit left out and you don't know what to do. And um, yeah, this suggests that maybe their relationship isn't that great at this point. But um, yeah. Basically, when uh, Chisato comes back home, she has this really nasty fight with Mahito where she says, like, oh, you're one of these people who complain on Twitter about others who try to do something while not trying anything uh, yourself. And it's really sad that you're like that. And yeah, it's not even that she's like that. She just realized, no, I can't fit in here. And the other part of this um, made cafe thing is when suddenly the Yakuza boss and his son go there on their mission to find new business models that Yakuza could um, take over. And they think, hey, uh, male dominated stuff is not so great. We need something more female oriented. So let's try a made cafe. So let's go there together because going alone would be a little bit, um, ooh, yeah. They would feel a little bit ashamed or embarrassed. Embarrassed is a correct word here, I think. Um, so they have to go together. And there's one funny thing here. Um, of course, I call it the Moeji Dai. And then they go in there and the father orders omrais for 2000 yen. So basically, an omelette on rice. And the girl who serves it is like, oh, yeah, I can uh, draw a picture or something on the omelette with ketchup. And the father is very excited. Oh, yeah. So he is like, please write Gokudo. So the um, other word for gangster or yeah, a little bit wicked ways. And um yeah, the girl said, oh, oh, I'm very sorry, they're a pretty difficult kanji, can't we really do something easier? So he comes with jingi, and uh, sorry, uh, jin, jingi no jin, jing is uh, pretty easy, but gi, gi, you can't write gi with, uh, with ketchup on omurice, that's impossible. So he freaks out and he asks her if she wants to be sent to Hardest, and I felt like hardest is a really strange choice of words for the subtitles. Why is it translated as hardest? And then I realized there's a little joke like uh, no, it's a meido kisa, so meido for maid, and hardest in Japanese or the underworld in Japanese is called meido. So he asked her if she she wants to be sent to meido, and uh, that's pretty funny. And I didn't really realize that the first few times and um yeah in the end they get killed but one one more funny thing here is that the brother could have realized that uh chisato might be the killer uh because he's smelling her and he's like oh you smell so nice but if he was smarter and if he listened to his sister he would know that it's Dodge and Gabbana and he should be really, really careful and maybe just uh, kill her instead of being killed. So he's really, really useless and uh, good final proof of concept here. Um, yeah, uh, one, one other tiny detail I just saw in my notes and I didn't write down. In between, between these scenes, we have a little, um, a little scene with the boss and they're having an argument and he tries to give them another job and stuff uh, like a mission like killing and stuff and um here because they're fighting their drinks are black and white i think mahido has a black drink so probably coffee and chisato has a white drink so either milk or kalpis i guess more likely kalpis so yeah cool and yeah in the end we, we get a big fat final fight like the daughter wants to wants revenge for her family so she asks them to come and fight them and they have a big fight it's amazing we have uh, here mr ino 
Mr. Uh, what was his name? Masa, Masayuki Inu, Inu who uh, shows up and uh, is like, yeah, I fight only with my hands and um, yeah. And there's a big, big fight. The thing is, uh, the whole movie, Shisato is building up the use of her machine gun and she brings it here and she keeps forgetting and losing it. And that's the, her main theme for this big fight because she's always looking for her gun. She's basically not very involved in the action. So that's a more or less smart choice to keep her out of the action while uh, Saori Isawa um, does the big fight scene with the uh, strong henchman. And um, it's a great fight. I think the one in the second it might be even better. But what I like about her fighting style is that she's... I mean, usually she's fighting men and she's smaller than her opponent. So she tries always to be really small and close to the enemy with her head first into the body. as She does that a lot. And I really like that. It makes a lot of sense because if you're close and small, you harder to get a really, really strong hit and um, it just looks good and this whole fighting style is a lot of clumsiness it, it looks clumsy because it's a real struggle like the body parts are being grabbed and pulled so you struggle to get your composure back is that the right word I hope and um, to get the upper hand and land a hit so it looks like a real struggle it looks like a real fight it's not very elegant for the most part but it's all very quick and precise and amazing and in the end she gets the win because she does a little she fakes something and then does something different yeah uses of hat uh, hats are great um uh, yeah, I think it was very exciting and uh, yeah, very great. And if there's anything I want to criticize about this movie, it's mostly yeah this little loose structure that makes you get lost if you don't know it. So maybe, yeah, that's one reason. And she said to being a little bit too crazy, why I didn't enjoy it so much the first few times. Now I feel like I completely got the movie. There's nothing really to... Um, find out anymore i hope i hope there will be more but uh now i have a feeling i've got an idea what this movie wants and why it does things so that works really well now um like i said this cheese hato character i think coming from the tv show helps a lot to love her much more that's very good very helpful so if you struggle with this one i would actually recommend watching the show it's a lot of fun and very very good oh and here in this final battle the uh, opponent does a little eye poke with a thumb i think and uh, she does the same in episode three of this show i felt very happy when i saw <laughs> um yeah so uh, these things work very well i have one other criticism that sometimes the sound mix is not particularly great i mean in general they don't use big sounds for impacts and stuff so it f i think that's a thing that's very prominent in the second movie where they have a lot of like close sounds yeah closing sounds that um should support the movements but it's all very grounded not so much like kung fu movie over the top sounds which uh, can be nice no but what what annoys me more is that very often the music is very down toned down like especially in the second one you have this metal soundtrack in the in the final fight and it's so quiet that it has literally no impact and here i feel it's slightly better but still I, I feel, feel like some sometimes the music should be more prominent should have more impact to support what we see and that would be nice um by the way i, I never noticed that here in many scenes you actually have the uh der Valkyre, um playing in some variations uh, usually like piano or something it's a 
very cool. I, I noticed that for the first time in the second movie, uh, in the, the TV show. So I guess it will be in the second movie as well. Makes sense if you called your movie Baby Valkyrie. So the Baby Valkyrie. And um, yeah, that, that's a nice detail that I never really noticed before. And now I noticed I'm happy. Um, yeah, uh, one, one, one last thing I completely forgot. I looked into my archive of uh, Kinema Jumpo and I found the reviews for this movie and they're surprisingly positive like usually Kinema Jumpo is like the it's, it's the oldest uh, movie magazine in Japan or maybe even the world over 100 years as far as I know and they can be a little snobby or a little um, yeah elitist but this one got quite decent uh, ratings uh, so usually they have three people rating a movie and here you got a three three and four out of five but so, so for, for me that sounds a little bit low but just because i'm very generous with my rating so here a three is uh, basically means yeah you can give it a try it's worth watching and um Basically, they, they say the same, like the characters are great, the action is good, that's a lot of fun. But there's one the, the guy who, or the human who gave it a 4, uh, was born in 49, so a little bit older person. And uh, made some, some great comments here, some other, same as me, some complaints about the sound. But he, uh, where is it? Serifuga ya uh serifuga raputeki ni nareba moto tanosh kata. So basically he wants the um how they speak the speaking patterns more like rap music, so it would be more fun. And that sounds just very funny to me that someone who is like seventy years old uh wants dialogue in movies to sound like rap <laughs> good idea i think um sakamoto should apply that at some point <laughs> maybe it works out i have no idea i, I think that was a, a great idea but um yeah it's a fun great movie i had a lot of joy i watched it like, like i said twice in two days and uh, it's uh, very good watch it watch part two watch part three watch the tv show and uh, enjoy the baby assassins They're very very good um thank you for watching it was quite long quite detailed but i hope not too boring and confused usually like i don't write scripts so i just speak like i feel and yeah that's what you get I have many things to do. I have a job. I have a German podcast. I've got this. So there's no time for scripts. I'm not sorry. That's how we do this here. It's the compendium of discomfort, not the compendium of joy and uh, relaxation. So uh, I'm Michael. Thank you very much. See you, I hope, soon. And uh, yeah, more baby assassins will follow. Bye.